Good morning, everyone. I'm Gina DeSalvo, the director of the Parents Giving Program, your host for our 30th annual Parents and Family Weekend. I'm thrilled to welcome a record number of you here once again for a wonderful weekend full of lectures, performances, open houses, athletic events, and more. So make sure you take advantage of everything that's going on. It's a really wonderful experience if this is your first one. If it's your second, third, or fourth, welcome back. Also, all of today's sessions, as well as tomorrow's keynote, are being recorded. So once the weekend is over and we have them all cleaned up, we'll be posting them on our website, and we'll be sending them all out to everyone as well. Now, a few quick housekeeping notes. If you haven't had the opportunity yet to register or to pick up your registration packets, there were registrations straight across the street at Sophia Gordon Hall. We'll be open until 6 o'clock tonight, and again tomorrow beginning at 8 a.m. We also would ask you to please take a moment to to find the closest exits. We have them in the front and the back of the auditorium. I don't think there's anyone in the balcony, so we're good up there. And also there's no eating, drinking, or smoking at any time in Cohen. If you don't mind, just take a moment to turn off or to silence your cell phones so that they're not interrupting while our speakers are starting. Okay, so our first session of the day We'll give you the opportunity to hear from our team in the Office of Residential Life and Learning about all the resources available to your student, as well as some of the exciting developments that have happened over the past year. I'd now like to turn the stage over to our fabulous director, Josh Hartman. Hello, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Welcome to, welcome to Parents Weekend. We're so glad that you uh, decided to come join us today. Um, and I also wanted to thank Gina and her team for allowing us to have some time to chat with you all about what we're doing within residential life uh, to support your students. So uh, we're glad for that opportunity. We wanted to start by just introducing members of our team that are here so you can put names to faces. Uh, if you haven't visited our website yet, all of our contact information is on the website. You'll be able to like see us on there too. But we thought it would be helpful for you to know who folks are before we just jump into talking about our work. So I'm going to ask our, our uh, professional staff team to come up to the stage real quick, um, and we will, we will introduce ourselves. Uh, as they're coming up, I'll start with myself. So again, my name is Josh Hartman. I use the he series pronouns, he, him, his, and I'm the director of residential life at Tufts. Uh, my role is to support all of these wonderful folks in the department and support our 4,000 students on campus as well as those who live off campus through uh, the work that Angie does. So I will turn this over to you all. Hello. Hey, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Jordan. I serve as the Assistant Director for Residential Education. I specifically work with the continuing student area. So if your student is a sophomore, junior, senior, or graduate student on campus, um, I help supervise the staff in those areas and make sure that your student has a great experience. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brendan Soltis. Uh, I'm also an assistant director for residential education. I, I work with all first year communities on campus, helping support uh, the transition to Tufts. Hi, I'm David Watts. I am the assistant director for housing services, so everything related to the housing selection, uh, room change uh, applications, everything goes like that goes through me. Uh, and I'm joined by Hi everyone, my name is Angie Sosa. I'm the Assistant Director for Residential Operations. So I oversee a lot of the logistical side of things that includes move in, move out, et cetera. I'm also the main point person for off-campus housing, so I do a lot of programming around that for our students. Hi everyone, my name is Sue McGlone. I use the she series pronouns. Um, I'm the Director of Fraternity and Sorority Life here at Tufts, um, and so that means that I oversee all of our fraternities and sororities on campus, as well as our theme and special interest houses. Um, and I also head up all of our hazing prevention efforts. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Great. So we are. Uh... So we're, we're going to bring up uh, some of these, these folks again to talk about their specific areas. I did also want to. I did want to introduce a couple of our residence directors. So uh, we have 10 residence directors who live among your students within the residence halls. Uh, Chase Jackson is our residence director working with our independent living area. Catherine Alias is working with one of our upper class student areas. And then Cesar Cruz is working with one of our first year areas. So we have a bunch more. Uh, a lot of our graduate, uh, a lot of our residence directors are graduate students and they're in class. So they were in class and that's important for them to be at. So we didn't ask them to skip class to, to join us today. 
So just to kind of give some framework as to what we're going to be covering today, we want to share a bit about what our philosophy and vision is for the residential experience at Tufts. We also wanted to talk about what does support look like within our residential community. Uh, you know, it, I can imagine I can imagine what it may feel like. I, I don't have kids uh, of my own, but I can imagine what it's like sending your kid off to college and not knowing what kind of support they're receiving. So we want to make sure that you know what we offer and how we could support you in supporting your student. Uh, we want to talk about how we uh, work to engage our students within their communities among each other and with the greater Tufts community. We also want to talk about on-campus housing selection, what that looks like for most of your students are probably thinking about housing for next year already. Uh, and so we want to talk about what that looks like on campus. We also want to talk about our theme, special interest in fraternity and sorority housing experience. It's an area that, that um, folks should be aware of because it's a great opportunity. And we're also going to talk about off-campus housing and what that looks like and some of the things that we've learned in working with our off-campus students over the years. Uh, ba basically, the way that we've set this presentation, thank you to those of you who've completed the survey that uh, Gina and her team sent out earlier. Uh, we actually based this presentation off of the questions that came in from I'm assuming many of you. Uh, so we're going to probably reduce the amount of time for big questions in the group. But what we're going to, what we're going to do is allow our staff to be here for individual questions for any of you, because a lot of your questions may be individualized for your own student situation. So we want to leave plenty of time for that. Uh, but we may have time for a few bigger questions at the end. Great. So residential life. What does our residential system look like? Uh, we, are a, we are a large mid-sized residential system as uh, college and university residence halls go. We have over a million square feet of residential space, 76 residential buildings on for, that we oversee on two campuses. Residential Life works with the uh, Medford Somerville campus and also with the SMFA. Uh, we have three residence halls on Beacon Street in Brookline. We uh, have some graduate students who live in our housing as well. We have 18 professional staff members. We have 116 um, RAs, basically, FYAs and CDAs, uh, 25 house managers, and then a variety of other student staff who work in our office. So we have a lot of folks who are here designed to support the residential community, and our community is, is quite large as well. So our, our department and the folks within our department uh, have worked very hard over the last few years to develop uh, a philosophy and vision statement of, of what does this work mean to us. Uh, the core values of what we do in residential life are based on health, safety, and community. We want to create and foster a healthy environment that is safe in a variety of different levels and also is uh, creating a vibrant sense of community for folks living in them. Uh, we're really focused on this idea of holistic growth. It's not just about uh, it, the Tufts experience is a great intellectual opportunity, but there's a lot of growth that happens in college outside of the classroom as well. And we're looking at, we're looking at that as well. We really value inclusive and caring communities, and we value creating opportunities in our residence halls to have caring and inclusive communities. Uh, and when they're not inclusive and caring, we really, we really work hard to address those issues and, and rectify them moving forward. We focus a lot on relationships, not only between roommates, which is like kind of a typical relationship, but also other folks on the floor, between students in the university in general, between students and faculty and staff and others. Uh, we, we all bring a high level of authenticity to our work with our students. Uh, I would hope that, that many of your students who have interacted with us or any of you who have interacted with us know that we care deeply about this work and it comes from a, a true sense of, uh, of care and wanting to help you all and your students have a great experience while you're here. Uh, and then belonging is, is a really important piece for us. We want all of our students to feel as though they belong, uh, whatever that means for them and in whatever community that, that feels right for them. So I'm going to uh, actually ask our residential education team to come up to talk a little bit about what supporting our students looks like within the residence halls. Uh, Brendan and Tim work with all of our staff who live in the um, undergraduate communities with the exception of theme and special interest housing. And they'll talk a little bit about what sort of support do we have for our students and uh, what are some ways that you can help your students more there. Oh, no. <laughs> it's not my usual clicker, so I, I apologize for that. Um, so I first want to talk about uh, the staff that we have in our halls. So we, we call them neighborhood teams. So e uh, we have a variety of buildings across campus, and we group them into neighborhoods based on community type as well as uh, location on campus. And so in each building, we have student staff that live in the building as well um, as our resident directors who uh, supervise um, those staff teams. Um, 
Every resident in the residence hall should know uh, the student uh, leader in the residence halls. Um, their door should be clearly marked. They should have um, outreached to all students uh, at this point of the year um, and be accessible through you know, a phone number or, or be able to, to knock on a door and, and receive support. Um, uh, our, our, um, our, our staff show up in the community in a variety of different of ways. Um, first, they uh, offer programming in, in all halls to promote um, uh, education as well as community building. Um, in addition, um, there is uh, an on-call system 24-7 uh, that supports our students through triaging um, any crisis situation um, as well as uh, emergencies. Um, in addition, uh, all our staff um, try and meet one-on-one -on -one with each resident to provide that one-on-one -on -one support um, and help connecting folks to resources. Um, in addition, RDs are also present in the community. As Josh says, they live in the halls and often has, have contact with students in similar ways. So we know that in order for students to be successful, they need to feel a sense of belonging with the institution, they need to feel comfortable with their living space, and it's important for them to develop connections with the folks that they're living with um, and the folks that they're taking classes with um, in order to just have uh, meaningful relationships, meaningful dialogue, um, and grow in the residence halls. So what we do um, within residential education is try and foster those relationships. Um, that can start with what Brendan was just alluding to with our student staff, but it also means connecting students to one another based on interests, based on um, things that they're going through, or you know, just having opportunities in the hall um, or whatever type of building it is um, to get to know each other. It's really important for us to start with you know, connection and be proactive in developing relationships rather than just being reactive to when residents have a crisis. So we really focus on creating relationships first. Um, in regards to conflict mitigation and resolution, you may imagine that from time to time, our students may come into conflict with one another. Um, shocking, I know. But uh, our goal really is to just guide them through that. It's an important part of the learning process and, and, their, uh, and growing and maturity uh, to be able to handle conflict in a productive way. Um, we don't ask that students go through that alone, though. We have our staff there to talk them through situations. We offer mediation if needed. Um, we meet with residents as much as as they need support um, in order for them to work through conflict. Um, one thing we'll say is that while we want, we really want to encourage them to give it a shot before we sort of alleviate whatever conflict there is. So if they are having conflict with a roommate, we're gonna try and work it out first before we move directly to a mo uh, room change because we want them to try and become more adept at conflict resolution. And I, I want to underscore what Josh mentioned uh, in, the, in our philosophy is that we really do care about students and we often uh, reach out to students, either the central staff, um, resident directors, as well as our student staff to check in um, if any concerns are, are brought to our attention. So um, it is normal if, if um, a student receives an email saying, hey, I uh, just wanted to check in and, and we often meet uh, to help uh, students connect to different resources on campus. Uh, so, um, you know, there was a lot of questions about uh, what, what you might be able to do to help um, encourage and empower your student um, here at Tufts. Um, I think the first and foremost is uh, encouraging them to reach out uh, to the first year assistant, community development assistant, or house manager uh, in the space that they live in. Um, they are one of the best first points of contact for any issue, concern, um, or, or even to get like more involved in the community. Another great point of contact is their resident director. Um, so they are, a lot of our resident directors are still graduate students, so they have that, you know, taking coursework in common. Um, they often uh, are really engaged in the residence halls. All of our resident directors put on programs or hold office hours for students. So if a student's having any concerns or just needs to get connected, if you have a student that hasn't really found their place on campus, I would encourage them to reach out to their resident director. Um, they're very available both during kind of business hours but also bu after business hours um, to uh, meet with students and make sure that we can get them connected to the community. Another important thing to consider when uh, we're talking about connection is to 
talk through what community looks like to them. So what is their current community looking like? Do they have friends? Um, are they connected over a, a certain interest? Um, we're gonna talk a little bit later about special interest housing, which is really an exciting opportunity for them. Um, but just talk to your student about their community um, and suggest that if they are saying, oh, I don't really know anybody, um, get in touch with some of these uh, uh, points of contact that we've talked about as far as their FYA, CDA, or their RD. And then, of course, um, connect with us. Uh, we, we often uh, talk with parents and families and consult with you all and what you're seeing uh, from your end and then help mobilize uh, support and resources that might uh, help your student be more successful here at Tufts. Um, so we are always open um, to chatting um, you know, in person, on the phone, via email um, about uh, any concerns that might arise. And then uh, just to to kind of put a cap on, on this piece, our residential education team, uh, they are incredibly, incredibly talented professionals, all of them, from the, from, the residential, from the residence directors to the assistant directors. Nadia, who's not here yet, I don't think, right? Nadia hasn't walked in. Our associate director will be here sure, shortly. And our FYAs and CDAs and house managers, they're all amazing resources. And so if you're ever feeling like you're having a problem or your student's feeling like they're having a problem, there are a lot of people to reach out to. And, and they are incredibly, incredibly accessible. I, all of them are very accessible, so they're a great, uh, great tool. I, I think something that sometimes gets lost a little bit is, uh, for those of you who were here for Jumbo Days and heard uh, Chris Rossi, our Dean of Student Life and Engagement, talking about like what was his biggest tip for, for parents coming in, sometimes when your student calls to complain or is angry about something or is frustrated, sometimes just listening is what they actually need. Like, I think a lot of the times our normal fallback is to, we wanna find a solution for people who are coming to us saying that they need help with something. Sometimes our students just really need to like kind of like let it all out. And you know, what, what our recommendation is, and we say this to our students when they come to us, what, what, would, like, what would you like this conversation to be? Would you like, like, how would you like us to, would you like us to start offering solutions? Would you like to just have a moment to be able to like vent it out so that we could be here as like a listening ear and, and be a support structure? Uh, and, and like listening I think is really important. And then once you're able to kind of hear what's, what's going on there, you all know who the people are to be able to reach out to, to or to encourage your students to reach out to. So thank you both, you are great. So uh, speaking of just listening, I think that th there's an important point about our department uh, that I, I wanna be able to share with the wider community. We listen quite a bit to our students, to families, to members of our community. When folks uh, say to us, uh, you know, we, this is a process that we are having struggles with, or this is a, you know, we're having trouble with this residence hall, it's not really conducive to community. Over the course of the last several years, and for university staff who've been here for multiple years, they've seen this, this growth, we've made a lot of changes to our residential life program and to our physical plant to, to be responsive to student growth and development needs and to needs and concerns of families that have brought things up. So uh, for example, one of the things that we did two years ago is we actually split our residential areas into a first year area that Brendan oversees and a continuing student area that, that Tim oversees. We also added a professional staff structure to be able to support our theme, special interests, and fraternity and sorority housing, which is what uh, Sue oversees. I'm gonna ask Sue to come up in a minute here too. Uh, so I, we, we do that, and we also have shifted our residential staff model. Even from this year to next year, we've, we've shifted what we're doing with our student staff to create more consistency and efficiency across the board. And everything is to support your students and their health and safety. So. Uh, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about the housing selection process. When we asked the feedback on the front end about what you all wanted to hear about this, I'd say like 90 something percent uh, of the folks in the room were concerned about housing for next year, whether it's on-campus housing or off-campus. So uh, David has been working very, very hard on getting our housing selection process ready to go. It's actually already started. So I'm gonna have David come up and talk a little bit about our housing selection process. For as much as I work with technology all day, I still have issues with things like this. So, so um, Tufts University does make the guarantee to have uh, housing for the first and second year students. Um, that's something that we're trying to clean up the language up on our website to indicate who is um, who that applies to. So, for specific questions about that, please feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards, uh, especially if you have concerns about exemptions or whatnot. So, um, right now, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is 
people who are going to be potentially fifth uh, semester um, on campus, we are trying to make it so that they can actually apply and be guaranteed housing for their full year instead of only the first semester in the fall. So that's a new change uh, that we're trying to implement and see if it's going to work for us. I'm positive, pretty hopeful, 50-50 that's going to work out pretty well. <laughs> so um, right now the applications have opened. We're looking at trying to get everyone into theme and special interest housing, which is one of the best ways for people to be guaranteed housing because that process wraps up before the lottery numbers go out. The lottery, uh, housing selection is kind of split up between two big important numbers, the lottery numbers and the wait list numbers. The lottery number applies mainly to um, people who are guaranteed housing, and then the wait list is everyone who is, as you can imagine, on a wait list to see if something opens up. So uh, all rising sophomores are going to get a lottery number even if they don't fill out the application, I will find them and I will give them a lottery number. And if they don't select housing, I will give them housing, so. Housing selection mostly takes place in the spring semester, the actual act of selecting rooms, um, with the exemption of, of course, I said the uh, theme and special interest, which will happen earlier on. So uh, we're still working on fine-tuning the timeline of what that looks like as well as where students will be living for the spring semester, like which residence halls we designate for which class years. So um, hopefully in the first few weeks of November we'll have that rolled out so you and the students will know what is available for who. So talk a little bit about the application uh, being live now. Um, so students can either choose, once they enter the portal, they can choose to, you know, update any personal information, if there's information that they are interested in an accommodation for um, either religious need or um, a disability that rises to the level of, or a medical condition that rises to the level of disability, um, they can get information about how to apply for accommodation, so that's really important. We put that right up front in the application this year, so all students know what resources they have available to them. So then they'll sign their housing license, that doesn't mean that they're done with the application, it just means that they've signed the contract. Um, but then they split up to, do they want to go into general housing, which is not the theme of special interest, and they can choose to form a group. Rising sophomores don't need to form a group, it's just going to give them more or less the same lottery number. If there's rising juniors, rising seniors, they do want to form the group, so the other group is either guaranteed everyone in the group gets a lottery number or gets a waitlist number, so it's better for their planning. Um, around December 18th, I'll release the lottery numbers and um, talked a little bit about that. Group formation, that's kind of what I talked about before, whether they need to form a group now or if it's okay to just go in by themselves. Group formation takes place in two parts, the surf part now, just for the lottery number purposes and then later on to determine what kind of um, suite or a room that they want to live in. So typically we'll go from the highest uh, number of students living in a space, like an apartment, a 10-person apartment, or a suite style. They would apply and say, all the students who are eligible for a 10-person, they formed a 10-person group, we have 40 10-person areas. The first 40 will be guaranteed that they will get that type of a space and everyone else will be able to form a different group later on in the process. Uh, so we, that's part of what group formation is all about is finding the right size. We do do singles after the 10 persons because we know that there's the highest demand is for large groups of friends together and then the people that want to live by themselves will go next, so. And then we go back up the line, six person, four person doubles, so on and so forth. So, applications opened on Thursday last week and they started working correctly uh, Tuesday this week. So we'll review the deadline for that. But um, it's a new process uh, this year where we intentionally wanted the, just the theme and special interest available, but then students were like, hey, can we have everything available? And so we said, sure, why not? And then we made it work. So. Um, students accepted are done. They can't go back into the room selection process at a later time. Um, if they don't, they'll have to go straight to the wait list uh, if they no longer want to live in special interest housing because 
they can't double dip like that. You made a choice that you want to live in the theme in special interest house. Um, you potentially took a spot away from someone else. We can't just let you go back into the process because you don't like what happened there. So, December 6, um, 5 p.m. is the application deadline to be added to the lottery for the housing selection. Again, if you have a uh, rising sophomore student out there, I will find them. They will get a lottery number. And then on the 18th, after I've cleaned up all those things, found those waywards, uh, rising sophomores, and given them um, applications, then we'll process it all out and determine how much availability we have for juniors and seniors. Um, after all this, we know all the sophomores that are going to be living on campus. So, and then we, all communication we prefer to go out through the Tufts University email address. So, always have your um, student check that. So, frequently asked questions: um, If you have a student studying abroad for either the fall or spring semester. If they go through this process now, they may not know that they're studying abroad for the fall or the spring yet. That is okay. We will still house them. Uh, we take them out. That's part of the reason why there is a wait list um, is because a lot of our students will not find out, especially if they're going through um, programs not affiliated with Tufts. Um, their students are, uh, at those other schools are gonna find out before our students will find out about their school. So we, um, are aware of that, we will house students if there's no um, fee for not going through with housing because they're studying abroad, so long as it's through a Tufts uh, approved program. So, what is the process for a room change? Um, there's information on the website about that, um, more in depth than what I'll say here, but basically it should always start with the first year assistant, your CDA, and or the resident director. Uh, if it gets to the point where it can't be resolved, then it will come through me. Uh, I do not like to just have students come to me uh, asking for a room change because I don't know what other vacancies are being offered to other students. So it's always best uh, that we always get the RDs and the assistant directors of residential education involved in that conversation before uh, I start making offers because then I overbook rooms like I did yesterday. But we fix that. My student is in a forced triple. Uh, we don't have forced triples. I just want to dispel that myth. We have been going through a process of right-sizing rooms over the course of the past several years. Um, if there is a student in a triple right now, it is because we have bought the furniture in most cases for that room to fit correctly or in the process of correcting that now. At the beginning of the semester, we had one or two rooms that were like, this really shouldn't be a triple, we fixed it. But right now, uh, we don't have forced triples. So it should be the right size room for the number of students living in there. So how are lottery waitlist numbers assigned? Um, everything goes through our housing software system. They will randomize based on the, the classification. Um, everyone gets a lottery number who's a rising sophomore. Um, the waitlist, uh, once we know how many applications, that's when we can really dig down into how many juniors, how many seniors. Last year, all the seniors that applied uh, for housing um, got a lottery number um, around December 6th or whatever the equivalent was last year, and then so many juniors. And then through that process over the next several months, everyone who was on the wait list was offered housing. So it's not uh, the end of the story. Uh, Angie will talk a little bit more about off-campus stuff in relation to the wait list later on. So. Why do we wait until the second semester uh, to do the housing selection? I get this question a lot. Uh, one parent asked us to do the lottery back in September, if possible. Um, friend groups change, uh, you, for, especially for the first year uh, students now. They don't know who they want to live with. They know who their friends are, but that's very different from knowing who you can live with in terms of who you want to spend time with otherwise. So. We want students to feel that out, um, and also it's a lot of the study abroad questions. So, am I going to be studying abroad or not? Uh, we try and give students as much time as possible to not select a room so we don't have as many people on the wait list, and so that we can go through the wait list as soon as possible in the spring. So, if it's in the fall now, people don't even know if they're applying to study abroad yet, and that just further puts people on the wait list, and it's not fair. People will generally know more or less what their spring and their plans for next semester are in the spring. Wraps it up for me. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as Sue's coming up to talk about fraternity sorority life and theme and special interest housing, 
as David was explaining to you, you probably can imagine that the housing selection and assignment process is like, it's kind of complex. There's a lot of moving parts to it. David has a lot of experience in, in doing this at multiple schools, not just here. Um, and so we do the best that we can. But again, we're, we're, all, we're all humans, so like we're, we're always open to having conversations about things. The way our current lottery process is set up is based off of years of student feedback. Uh, the process was not what it is now several years ago, and there was a lot of uh, not so great vibe about it uh, back then, so we're, we're working to try to make it as inclusive and positive of an experience as we can. We certainly know that there's pressure points, and we work, we work to try to like resolve those, and that's what David's role is. But I'm gonna turn it over to Sue to talk about fraternity sorority life and theme and special interest. Thank you. Uh, so fraternity and sorority life and theme and special interest housing, uh, or fraternity and sorority housing and um, theme and special interest housing, um, are really great ways for um, students to be able to live on campus in their um, sophomore, junior, senior years, um, just junior and senior year in the houses for fraternities and sororities, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But um, it's a really great way for students to kind of um, really hone in on the club or organization or their friend group or um, some other type of connections that they have on campus um, within a living community. So a lot of them are designed to be able to um, really complement the things they're involved in on campus. Um, so I'll talk first about fraternity and sorority life. So um, right now about 12% of our undergraduate population um, is members of a fraternity or sorority. We currently have 10 organizations um, that are active. Um, seven of them are um, in on-campus facilities, so um, those are either um, owned and operated by the university or, or owned and operated by an independent um, alumni house corporation. Regardless of ownership, we still do provide um, support to the students who live there um, through the house manager model um, and through other levels of support and oversight. Um, Currently, our soft, you can, uh, are eligible to join a fraternity and sorority or sorority in your sophomore year, so we give students an opportunity to um, be on campus for a year, figure out what they want to be involved in before deciding to join a fraternity or sorority, so we do that in the um, fall of sophomore year, so um, right now our, um, we have about uh, 300 new sophomores joining the fraternity and sorority community. Um, and then they would be able to select to live in the house either junior or senior year. So um, that's a, a really great opportunity for the students once they've found that connection on campus. Um, our fraternities and sororities are doing a lot on campus. Um, we've, we're, uh, Tufts, like many other institutions, are in a state of reform with our fraternities and sororities. Um, and we're really trying to hone in on some of the leadership opportunities and the um, education and service that they can provide. They're also a really great social outlet to be able to provide them with that um, formal capacity of belonging and, um, and friendship building. So um, it's a really great opportunity for our students. Our theme and special interest houses are another opportunity for students to um, select a student group, a uh, um, certain connection that they have with students to live on campus. We currently have 18 houses on campus, and those are in our wood frame houses, or our, uh, some of them are in, our, in some suites, in our, in our residence halls. Um, they are break, broken up into a couple of different categories. So we have language and culture houses that are typically connected to a department on campus, um, where they would be learning more about the culture of a um, certain department or, and the language. Um, Identity-based houses, which are connected to um, some of our identity-based centers on campus. Um, and then special interest where they're connect, they um, come together based off of an interest that they have. Um, we have a sustainability house, we have a house, um, an arts house, students that are interested in, um, in the arts, things like that, and they really just are able to um, connect with each other and put on programs for each other and for their community um, based off of all of those things. Um, they're all supported by our office as well as a department or center, like I mentioned. Um, so they're really getting a lot of connection, po uh, connection points on campus in order to um, facilitate the growth that's happening in them. Um, and as David said, applications are open right now for next year. So this is something that's a really great opportunity for students to be sort of their first choice option for living on campus um, and being able to select to live into one of these houses. Um, the fraternity and sorority house housing selection goes through the organization, but the timeline is the same. So we would like to place people in the fraternity and sorority houses and theme and special interest houses by the end of November um, for the following year. The opportunities in theme and special interest houses are also um, with leadership, um, community impact, social, um, they do a lot of some educational programming. Um, and then this year, well next year, um, we're going to have a new opportunity for students to be able to create their own theme house um, or a special interest house. So this is a really exciting opportunity for students to have a one year um, community that they create with their friends um, based off of a, an interest or, um, or purpose. So we're going to be putting those applications 
comes out soon, um, but a really exciting opportunity for students who are trying to really hone in on something and do that in a collaborative environment in a residence hall. Okay. Sure, yeah. Um, as I said in my introduction, I don't have a slide about this. Um, as I said in my introduction, I also head up all of our hazing prevention efforts for the university. Um, and so um, what we are currently doing, we're a part of the Hazing Prevention Consortium, which is a um, program out of the University of Maine where they were doing, they're doing a lot of the leading research on hazing prevention. Um, it's a three-year program that we're in. Um, we're actually currently in year three, but it's um, an evidence-based approach to hazing prevention. Um, and so what we've been doing is collecting in the first year we collected a lot of data about um, where hazing is happening on campus and, um, and ways that we can be approaching that. Um, and we learned th that consistent with national data, there is hazing happening on campus in a wide variety of organizations and teams. Um, and we've been working on um, really working with students to understand the different levels of hazing and the different types of things that um, could be considered hazing and ways to um, address that and to build community and to um, build, do uh, work on their onboarding processes in a way that's really safe and enjoyable um, that doesn't put anybody in any harm's way. So um, I, don't, I don't have any slides about it, but uh, if anyone wants to talk about hazing, I can definitely talk about that. And um, you know, with the work with the theme and special interest houses and the fraternities and sororities, like I said, those are community building spaces um, as well as any of our student organizations or, or teams on campus. Um, they're spaces that we wanna make sure they're having a safe and worthwhile experience. Um, and hazing is one of the things that we want to make sure that we're addressing in, um, you know, a really proactive approach. So just to, to echo something that, that Sue said about the benefit of these types of, of communities, uh, we hear a lot from juniors, who, rising juniors, who are really stressed about housing options. Uh, the theme and special interest process and the fraternity and sorority process happens outside of the lottery. Meaning, if you apply for a special interest house, you apply, and you, or you're in a fraternity and sorority and you apply to live in the fraternity sorority house as a rising junior, you don't have to worry about being one of the, the lucky ones who gets a lottery number. You're put into the housing before we even generate the lottery numbers. So I think that's something, and the process is open right now, and it's open to all continuing students. So it's one of those things that you may want to encourage your students if they're at a level of, of stress or anxiety about it, but that's a great option for them, especially if there's a theme that they might be interested in. Th those houses are, are really, they're really great, and there's some, some awesome opportunities there. Uh, Sue's, Sue's work with fraternities and sororities, but specifically with theme and special interest, is another area where we've been growing as a department. Uh, up until this year, we never had full staffing of all of our residential spaces on campus. This year we do, meaning we have residential life staffing in our fraternities and sororities and in our theme and special interest houses now. So that provides an additional level of support and uh, vibrancy to the residential experience. So what I'm assuming a lot of you are here to hear about is off-campus housing. Angie is your person for off-campus housing. So I'm gonna turn it over to her to talk a little bit about, about that experience. I'm gonna go sit back here. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, as Josh was saying, we definitely acknowledge that housing on campus can be a very stressful situation for a lot of our students. Um, many of them come back their sophomore year prepared to sign a lease right away. This is something that we highly discouraged um, for a number of reasons, um, one of which being they're struggling through navigating what that process looks like. Um, we have run into situations before where parents aren't actually fully knowledgeable about how that process may look for a student. So one of our main efforts are to really help with educating the students on what that looks like, what does a lease mean, you know, um, how expensive is this gonna cost, et cetera. Um, prices at the beginning of the school year, that's I'm saying August, September or so, they tend to be a little bit high and a lot of that is as a result of the panic that kind of has historically passed down from year to year from a lot of our students. I think they're just kind of hearing it from a lot of our upper class students as well. Like if you don't sign it right now, you're not gonna find something that's gonna be helpful or in a good location or a good price, et cetera. Um, so what we have seen, sorry to say, is that there are some landlords who kind of feed off of that panic. They've sometimes pressured many students into signing a lease or feeling pressured into signing a lease right away. And those students may not fully understand what the process is or might not have the money put together, may feel like my, my friends are feeling very stressed and now I'm stressed about it, et cetera. So we really wanna make sure that our students are educated on that process. Um, as I was saying, they're not necessarily getting the best options because they feel that stress. Um, there is also the point of 
cost, cost associated, a lot of things to kind of consider are what are those upfront costs. As you may or may not know, you've got security deposits, first and last month's rent, sometimes a broker's fee if you're working with a broker. Um, and that can be very expensive very quickly. Um, we definitely have some students who are on financial aid who this is a big concern about as well. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about what the financial aid process looks like. I can speak a little bit to it, but that's best having a conversation with the financial aid representative. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, a lot of students sign it because they think I'm not going to have the chance to live on campus my junior and senior year. But they're signing a lease prior to even applying to see what the lottery or the waitlist situation is going to be. So they actually don't know whether or not they're going to have the chance to live on, on campus. Um, keeping that in mind, one of the things I often suggest to students is calm down first, take a breath, let's talk about this. Do you have any interest on living on campus? If so, why don't we wait until the application goes through, you could actually see whether or not you're going to be getting a lottery or a waitlist number. And then from there, if you're you know, high up on the waitlist and you're like, okay, there's no chance of me finding anything, which may or may not be true. Like Josh said earlier, we were able, and uh, excuse me, David said earlier, we were able to offer spaces to everybody that was on our wait list. A lot of those people did not take it. Reason being, they were able to locate off-campus housing options in the spring semester, like we hope most people do. Um, and then also, as, as David was also mentioning, we have students who may not remain friends with the same friend group. Um, a year is a really quick time in your first year to kind of determine, is this group the group that I want to spend my living space with? I'll be upfront, I've got plenty of best friends and I don't want to live with any of them. So there's that. So just some tips for navigating what that process is, and this is a lot of what the conversation I have with the students early on is. And, things that I will go through with those students in person. I've had plenty of conversations with parents also over the phone just to kind of let them know what our resources are. One, no need to sign your, your lease a year in advance. I've never heard of this before coming to this school, so I'm hoping that I can count on you all to tell your students, don't do that just yet. Just calm down, go talk to Angie, she'll, she'll, she'll calm you down. Um, Educating yourself on the process, utilizing our university resources. Um, I've been at the school for a little bit over a year, and one of the main things that I did when I first got here was educating myself on what Massachusetts tenancy laws look like. What are the specific things that students need to be aware of? Um, what are some tricky things that they might think, well, of course I would do this, but they're actually not supposed to do that. How does that kind of work with it? So I've spent a lot of time kind of building out our website to make sure that those resources are available for the students to kind of go through and look at on their own in their own time. But I do do a lot of programming that specifies on those particular areas as well. Number one question that I get is, what can I be doing now if you don't want me to sign the lease now? Start saving your money. Because one, it's always great to have a savings account, right? And then two, if you do need to end up moving off campus, at least you've started saving that process. If you're a student that has financial aid, then I would suggest going and having that conversation with your financial aid representative to kind of see what are my funds going to look like. Just uh, kind of a heads up, if your student is on financial aid, financial aid will assist with off-campus housing. The tricky thing in the matter is the disbursement process. So a lot of times, excuse me, disbursement for that upcoming year isn't happening until September. And if you've got a student who is signing a lease that starts in June, one, they have to consider all of the upfront costs that they have to pay, which could be the equivalent of three to four months of rent. And then two, if it starts in June, there's a lot of students who have questions about, okay, can I find someone to sublet during those June to August months that I may not be here? Which, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, I also suggest that students have important conversations with their friends and their families. One, a lot of times when they're filling out the application, signing leases, et cetera, um, those landlords or property managers or brokers are going to ask for a co-signer. A lot of our students don't even know what a co-signer is. So that's number one, let's talk about what that looks like. Um, I'm assuming everybody knows, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, co-signer is someone who's responsible for that rent if the student is unable to pay it on their own. Um, and then as well, having that conversation with your friends, like, okay, is this something that we want to consider? Um, what are we prepared for? What does our budget look like, et cetera? 
and then also participating in the ongoing programming that's happening through our office, as well as coming to chat with me or anybody else in our office that can talk about specific elements. I've sat down with students to talk about financial aid and kind of point them in the direction of who's the best person to have that conversation with. Or, okay, we've seen a house, can you help us look over this lease, et cetera. I've definitely done a lot of that as well. So some of the frequently asked questions, number one, tends to be subletting. Um, and this falls in the boat of our students who are going abroad, but as well um, students who are looking for that summer period. The tricky thing in all this is it's a basic principle of supply and demand. We're gonna have a lot of students who need people to sublet their spaces and not necessarily a bunch of people who need the space to sublet on a given period. So one of the questions that I get a lot from students who are potentially going abroad is, does it make sense for me to sign a lease? Well, it's very dependent. I always suggest, why don't you have a conversation with some friends, maybe survey some other people. You can post something on your class Facebook page. Um, our website also has a message board area. Just to kind of see, is there anybody out there who maybe has the same question, but is going abroad in a different semester than you are? Because a lot of times you can have a conversation with a potential landlord about what that subletting process looks like, and you can kind of swap it off, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, I've also had students who say, well, I don't know if I feel comfortable with signing the lease. I always suggest, you know, go ahead and apply for on-campus housing. This year we were able to kind of offer a fall semester only housing. Um, just based on how many students we saw that were going abroad in the spring semester. We're working to do that for next year as well. Um, but also, they can themselves also look for a sublet. They might run into that situation. The cool thing about our website, one of our, one of our websites where they can kind of see what spaces are available, et cetera, is that they can kind of create a roommate profile and kind of look out for those types of people who are running into the same dilemma as they are. Um, Next question is regarding lease reviews. I can definitely sit down and go over leases. In my experience, many of them are standard and they cover the same points. Um, there are some elements here and there that I, I might have a, a few extra questions and advise the students to talk to their potential landlord about. Um, I will say, number one, a lot of students are not sure, you know, do I, do I submit an application fee? Fun fact is Massachusetts, that's not something that they should be doing in Massachusetts is submitting an application fee. I think a lot of them are under the impression, well, I have paid an application fee to apply to go to college. It makes sense that I would have paid to apply to live somewhere off campus. But that's something that's like, you know, a little bit tricky of a thing that you would assume is probably the case, but not necessarily. So I go over a lot of those things because sometimes those are listed in the lease. Um, I also try my best to give them information that may not be listed in the lease so that they can go into the situation more informed. That way the landlord hopefully is getting that, you know, they're thinking or they've got someone helping them think through the process. That way they don't kind of get scammed at the end of it. The last question that kind of came up was regarding multiple year leases. I would discourage this the same way I would discourage signing a lease so early, reason being you're not really sure what you're getting into. You may think, you know, well the place was nice, the landlord seemed okay, but it might be a sketchy landlord who pops up every week and wants to see how you're living and treating their space. And it's happened. I'm saying this from experience. <laughs> um, but also these are things that I don't suggest because if you're not 100% sure if you're going to like the space, you don't want to sign a lease so quick to when you've moved in. A lot of landlords, that's why they have a lot of students who are signing their leases in August, September. Um, and those students, maybe their lease started in June, but they didn't start living there until August. So they don't actually know, you know, is my landlord someone I can trust? Is this a comfortable living environment? Do I like the people that I live with, et cetera? Um, same goes for the multiple year leases. Kind of signing that away is not the best situation just because you're not 100% sure what it's gonna be like. So I always suggest kind of holding off. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to have our students understand is we need to take back the power here. Because a lot of times our landlords are thinking, and not our landlords, but the landlords in the area are thinking, they need housing, they're freaking out about it, I'm gonna make some money off of this, so let's do it. Um, so I'm trying to help them understand. You don't need to do that right now, let's take back the power, let's learn about the process, and let's see what happens. So that's it.
Hello? Hello? Okay, great. Okay, so um, we're going to, we do have a little bit of time to do some questions and answers. So here's what I'm going to, I'm going to ask our, oh, oh, actually, yeah, I'm going to introduce the people who came in. Actually, there's a couple of them. So um, Nadia, Nadia Vargas is our Associate Director for Residential Education. She oversees our uh, residential staff and programs um, in our first year and traditional upper class areas and apartment style areas. Um, and then... Kristen Wodorski is one of our residence directors. She's um, in one of our first year areas. Is that it? Did I miss anybody else? We're all here. Okay, so uh, we're gonna do like the Q&A from down here just so that like I don't have to be the only one answering questions. We have a great group of resources here. The question that I will, uh, or the request that I have for you all, if you have a question that's like, so my, my child signed a lease that has this particular thing on this on it, and was that legal or something? We could save that for the individual consults that we're still gonna do in the next like 10, 15 minutes. But if there are any questions for the greater good for, for the whole group, just like raise your hand and then we'll run around with the mic and we could try to answer them for you. So it looks like we got one in the back there. Oh, and one in the front. Oh my God, there's everywhere. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Hello. There you go, you're good able to work with the switch. Um, <laughs> so you said there were 400 slots uh, for groups of 10. Um, can you give us an idea how many slots there are for groups of six and four, as well as the general demand for each of those three groups? Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're working on it soon. It was an old infographic that we had up last year that more or less broke down by buildings, what space had like six persons, 10 persons, and we're working on getting it updated and more uh, screen reader friendly uh, for this upcoming year. I will say on, on that, what, one of the things we're trying to do this year is really maximize the, um, the usage of these spaces. What we had last year is we had a lot of spaces that were reserved for different class years, but not everybody was picking those spaces, and we had a bunch of vacancies at the end. That's not really cool, because then we have a bunch of juniors that we said you don't have a lottery number anymore. So we're trying to do what we can to really kind of, I'm not using the word force, but we're trying to make sure that people actually use the bed spaces that we actually have available. And so that's, some, that's the work that David's doing now. I would say in the next couple of months, there will be some level of an infographic out there that will be able to show how many spaces there are for each class here. Cool. The demand uh, was a very interesting one. That I'd have to look and see how many people applied for that type last year. Um, if you send me an email, maybe I can try and dig in a little bit like in the coming weeks about that after I've gotten some of the bigger things off the list because that's a question a lot of the students ask. The students will come in all the time asking like, well, what if this? I'm like, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to process. I don't have all the data I need and it really depends on what each individual student will want and it's a lot of data points to try and correlate. So those are, we can try, but we can't promise that we're gonna be able to game out every single possible scenario. Other questions? Can you tell us what are the existing 18 special interest groups? Y yes, I don't wanna forget any of them. So there's, they're, all listed, they're all listed on our website. It, some examples. So language and, do you, want, do you want to share a couple of them? I'm going to let Susan. Yeah, I mean, I, I could try, but um, I definitely encourage you to look at the website. But um, in terms of some of our, um, yeah, so like the language and culture houses, we have um, a Spanish language house, a French language house, German language house, um, Chinese language house, Japanese language house, Russian. Um, the Russian house is like Russian and Slavic um, culture. Um, German, did I say that? Okay, um, so those are probably our language houses. For our um, identity-based houses, they're um, correlated with our group of six centers. Um, so we have a um, rainbow house um, connected to our LGBT center, um, a um, Latina um, house connected to our Latino center. Um, let's see, what I'm, now I'm blanking on everybody. Cape and house, oh, here's a list, thank you. Look at that, awesome. I could have done it. Oh yeah, I sent this email this morning. Thank you. Um, <laughs> awesome. Um, but they're not in. They're in alphabetical order, not. Um, so yeah. Uh, let's see. We have the um, La Casa, the Latina House, uh, Muslim House, and um, our Jewish Culture House are our two religiously affiliated houses. Um, international House for international students um, and students interested in international programs. Um, the Asian American House. 
Um, and then for our um, special interest, we have the arts house that I mentioned. We have a, cra a crafts house, which is, um, they do a lot of like cooperative programming. It's like a cooperative living space. Um, the hive is our sustainability house. Um, so they do like a lot of um, programs around green living and sustainability. Um, and then our fraternity sorority houses are the houses that are um, affiliated with a fraternity or sorority program. Um, and the, those, the theme of that would kind of be that they're connected to uh, having shared values and um, friendship and, and that sort of thing. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. One basic question for me. Uh, what's the percentage of uh, houses available on campus for the junior and senior students? Meaning, uh, for the total number of students, like 50% lives on campus and 50% lives outside? Is that? So so uh, well, we'd have to get back to you on like what the specific like what the specific number number is. Mm -hmm. But if each class is somewhere, our incoming first year classes are usually somewhere around fifteen hundred ish. Uh, there's a little bit of like transfer transition type stuff from one year to the other. So if we're talking about like the high fourteen hundreds, we house all the first and second year students, which is just about three thousand together, and we have a, about thirty. It's about thirty nine hundred. 3950 um, total undergraduate bed spaces left. So we're talking about 900 beds split between the senior and junior class. So if you figure each class is about 14, 1500, we have 900 bed spaces for the juniors and the seniors. It sounds like a really small number, but I think the thing that's like important, I wanna highlight what Angie said before. Every student this year who wanted to live on campus got a space and we still have, like we still have space available right now. Somebody came to us right now and wanted to live somewhere. Uh, so. It's just, it seems like a small number. We do actually find that a lot of our seniors opt to live off campus anyway. Uh, it's an independent, it's like a growth, uh, like a general like growth and development mindset thing. A lot of times seniors want to be more independent in their living situation. And so as David said, I think David said this, last year all of the seniors who applied for housing by the application deadline received a lottery number. So 100% of the seniors who wanted to live on campus if they applied by the housing application time last year lived on campus. That number was like three something. It's like 300, I think. It was like 350. That's 350 out of like a class of 1400. But those were the only people who actually wanted to live on campus. So I think it's a great question to ask. But the other, the other part of that question that we can't directly answer for you is how many of those students want to live on campus versus how many of them want to live off campus. Because those seniors, you know, we, we had an opportunity to offer some more there. So we, we can get you some specific numbers. You can reach out to us and we can talk a little bit more. Yes, back there. Yes, thank you. Our daughter is a rising sophomore. She is interested in a group living situation. Her friendships are still developing and shifting <laughs> around, as you uh, pointed out. So when does she need to have that group identified? It sounds like it's sometime in the spring, perhaps. March. March. Early March, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of time still. OK. Thank you. I just had one follow-up. I'm sorry. This, we're in partnership. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was a deadline December 6th that someone mentioned. Correct. So the, the deadline for December 6th is for the housing application. So students have to apply for housing by December 6th. As David was saying, if you're, for your, your student who's a rising sophomore, let's just say she's like, well, I don't want to live on campus next year. I'm just not going to put in a housing application. David's going to find her and put her in anyway and is, she's still gonna get a lottery number. The second phase of that is group formation that'll happen in the spring, which is where they'll decide who they wanna actually live with. We give them a little bit more time to do that. There's some in the front. Hi, just have a logistical question. When your student's lottery number comes up, what level of specificity do they get to choose? Is it like a movie theater where you say, I want that seat, you get a specific room, or just a dorm, what's single, or how specific? So that is kind of where the group formation comes in, where once they have their, uh, their lottery number and they start going through everything in March to say, all right, 10 persons, show me, like, do my group of 10 want to live in a 10 person? They apply for that kind of like a lottery process. So 
the person with the highest lottery number within that group would form the group and we'd come up with a list of all the different um, people and they'd say, okay, we got it. And then based on what's available from their lottery number in that order, they go in and yes, like an airline um, ticket or a movie theater or a concert, they go through the portal, they have so much time to select a room, put everyone into each bed, and then contact me afterwards to say, oops, you screwed up, we want this person in this room. Anyways, um, so it's like that. They go online in a portal to fill all that stuff out. And then if it's not the 10 person, if they couldn't find those 10 uh, seats in a row in the movie theater or the concert hall, they go down to the next, uh, reform the group uh, in a different day and pick the next day after that. I want, to, I want to add on to that too. I've worked at six different universities and I've never seen a system like the way we do it here and it's actually really great. Like the way we do it here is actually pretty cool. Uh, if we, What we do is we put the most desirable groups first, like the desirable group sizes. So for 10 person groups for sophomores, for example, we will only allow the right number of 10 person groups to form as the number of bed spaces we have. That way, unlike students at other schools who are waiting until lottery day to find out whether or not they're gonna be able to live with their friends, they'll know when they get their group approved that they are definitely gonna get a 10 person space. 100% they will get a 10 person space. It's just about which 10 person, like which 10 person space they get, if that makes sense. If they don't get a 10 person space, we will break up their group and they'll have the opportunity to reform as a six person or an eight person or two, five, well, there's no five persons, but like, you know, a couple of two persons or things like that. So, and we can talk through, a lot of those are like specific to individual cases. We can talk through hypotheticals with you on, on that kind of stuff too. So the question was where can you find the information about where the different like spaces are? Uh, the information will be on the website in an easier to read form about what's available this year. But if you look on our website now, you can look at all of our residential options that we have. And on each one, it tells you how many different types of bed spaces there are. So it'll say there are 130 doubles, there are 20 singles, there are, and it'll go by that by each building. We'll make it easier for your student to read though. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna do maybe like one or two more questions and then we'll do time for us to ask or do individual, yeah. Hi, um, I have a freshman. Uh, I've heard, and I don't know if this is accurate, but I've heard that the number of, I guess, freshmen, maybe sophomore, is larger, and maybe that's part of the reason why there's a lot of stress, at least what I've heard from parents and maybe the kids in terms of the housing issue. Mm -hmm. So can you dispel that, or is that part of the issue that there's, whether it's on campus versus sure. the off campus, regardless of sure. how you explain things. Yeah, so we've, we've uh, the university has added uh, a few over 400-ish beds over the last two or three years. So we've actually added spaces on campus, we've acquired additional properties over the last couple of years, and actually David's working, David is working right now with our facilities folks to identify other spaces that we can use. And when we're saying other spaces, we're talking about rooms that are like literally sitting unused right now, we're not talking about putting seven people in a room designed for one. We're talking about rooms that are literally empty right now that we're trying to find more space. So we've worked over the last couple of years to really increase the number of bed spaces we have. The first year class has certainly been increasing, but the number of beds we've been adding has been outpacing it. Not by a huge, huge amount, but it's been outpacing it. So in terms of like the, the difference between the two, I think to Angie's point about the, this panic thing, the, the panic piece has been existing in this neighborhood, in Medford Somerville, for a very, very long time. And unfortunately, it's part of the tough culture with our students that's really hard to break students out of. But the number of students who signed leases, what was it, like 70% or something signed leases in the spring? It was, like a, it was a very high number. The, 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 the real number of the people who actually signed leases in the spring versus the fall, uh, we, we do have the, there are spaces, there are rental units that are in Medford and Somerville that are like, open in the spring. So I think that the, uh, the feeling of the housing crunch, just like with any urban environment in the country right now, especially Boston, knowing the Boston housing market, this is a crunch everywhere in, in the country, but definitely in the Boston area. There's definitely a housing crunch in general, like big picture. Uh, we've done the best that we can from the university's perspective to increase the number of bed spaces that we have. Clearly we can do, we can do more, but we need you know, more capital for that. There's a lot of, we can talk about that individually, about the kind of work that we've done and what we're looking at in the future also. A lot of that's actually outside of our scope also because construction, like capital planning and construction is like sort of a different area of the university from us. They build it, we fill it, kind of. That's what the thing is. So we do, we do what we can, but yeah. Yes, we'll do one more back there and then we'll do individuals. I think you sort of addressed um, my question with what you were just talking about. I was going to ask, is this housing crunch that the kids seem so panicked about, is it the same housing crunch that's existing with your peer schools around the Boston area and other schools here in the East Coast? 
Yeah. You, you can accommodate around 30% of the juniors and seniors in on-campus housing. Is that the same? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because every, in every school in our area handles their housing slightly differently and has different requirements and guarantees for what they offer to folks. So when you have a, when you have a campus like Northeastern that has, what, 12,000 students or something like that that live on campus? I mean, it's a different scale of, of folks living on campus there. I think one of the things that we found in working with our neighbor, like our partner schools in the area, the intense crunch to sign a lease a year in advance in October is like one of those very special Tufts things. Like, very, very special. Like the students at Northeastern are not signing leases until the spring for the fall. The students at BU are not signing leases for the fall until the spring. It's just not happening there. And if you talk about a tough housing market, I mean, like downtown Boston, like the Fenway, Back Bay, like that's a, that is a tough, Austin Brighton, it's a tough housing market down there. Uh, so our, our challenges are slightly different. Uh, we also are a little different than schools like BC and Wellesley and other schools that are in the area that actually do have more physical, you know, physical spaces for their students. So we, uh, you know, I'd say we have our unique, we have our unique challenges. Uh, I've worked at a bunch of other urban schools. I worked at NYU for a few years. I worked at George Washington University, which is also my alma mater. Very similar issues in those sorts of uh, environments as well. Uh, I think that the, the, the difference is that in a lot of other uh, municipalities, you have one city that you're working with. We have like a really great opportunity that we're working with both Medford and Somerville where we are. It's awesome. It, it creates uh, some complexity when it comes to increasing spaces and increasing occupancy. But it's, uh, you know, our relationships are good. We're continuing to like improve as we can. Like I said before, and this is not me trying to like shirk responsibility here, our capital planning folks are working on this kind of stuff very hard. We're working in concert with them and we're doing the best we can to try to maximize, you know, filling the spaces that we have without overcrowding, if that makes sense. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to transition to like individual questions. If any of you have any questions for any of us, we're actually to allow them to set up for their next session. We're going to go out to like the lobby in the front over here and you can come and find us. All of our information is on our website. Feel free to reach out individually and we respond very quickly. Thank you all for coming.